Welcome, Age of Vintage Society. Frank Capra's work has become so well known and respected that it is today used as a yardstick by which critics and the public measure a certain type of purely American film comedy. The legendary film director knew that the Golden State isn't about rich moguls, but about the struggles and triumphs of ordinary people. Capra's films are known for being upbeat and sometimes cheesy, but beneath the surface are rather dark stories of American corruption. How Frank Capra touched the hopes and fears of the people. Make sure to watch the video until the end and leave your thoughts in the comments. If you're new here, join our wonderful community by subscribing to the Age of Vintage channel. Frank Capra has fallen badly out of fashion in recent decades. While still well known for the extraordinary Depression-era Purple Patch that produced It Happened One Night, Mr Deeds Goes to Town and Mr Smith Goes to Washington, the critics have rarely been kind. His work is routinely derided as Capra Corn for its perceived sentimentality and fairy tale idealism, while the man himself is written off in favour of contemporaries Howard Hawks, Preston Sturgis and Ernst Lubitsch. Capricorn is the term used to describe Frank Capra's style of movie making, but even if his films feel too sentimental to many critics and moviegoers, there is no denying the mastery he had of the film medium or that he developed a style uniquely his own. In the 1930s he was the top director in Hollywood, turning out a series of films that touched the hopes and fears of the nation as it struggled through the Great Depression and, in the process, Capra garnered more Oscar nominations for himself and his pictures than any other filmmaker of the decade. Motion pictures would be about as varied as Sunday morning TV sermons if all filmmakers answered that evangelical call, but there are times and places for promoting the simple values of life, and no one in the first century of film was better at picking those spots than Frank Capra. From the 1934 It Happened One Night, in which romantic love transcends social class through his Common Man trilogy, Mr Deeds Goes to Town, Mr Smith Goes to Washington, and Meet John Doe, in which the raw idealism of small-town simpletons wins over big-time corruption, through the 1946 It's a Wonderful Life, in which an angel shows a good man just how good he is. Capra lifted the spirits of one generation and left a cinematic calling card for all those to come. It is sentimental enough for him, no one could ever accuse Capra of lacking sentiment, but it doesn't have the other side, the raciness, cynicism and air of knowing urbanity that put the edge on his films, gave them their crisp, dark counterpoint and elevated them to timeless classics. Other major figures from the 1930s survive him, Catherine Hepburn, his favourite actress, and James Stewart, but Capra was the last of the star directors of the 30s and the man whose movies in many ways came to symbolise the era. He was the most honoured of the 30s directors, the Oscar winner in 1934, 1936 and 1938, and it was Capra who, more than anyone else, shifted American film from a producer's to a director's medium. It was Capra as much as Wells, Ford or Hitchcock who influenced generations of succeeding filmmakers. Frank Capra was also a mass of contradictions, conservative and radical, traditionalist and rebel, iconoclast and mythmaker, idealist and cynic, worshipper and wisecracker. It's that volatile blend of opposites that has kept his films alive and vital, and has turned one of them, It's a Wonderful Life, into a cinematic national anthem. If it's not the greatest movie ever made, a title that Capra himself claimed for it, it's probably produced more tears, more repeat viewings and more good feelings than any other. Whether you regard the unabashed sentimentality of it as Capra-esque or Capra-corn, whether that final scene in the Bailey living room makes you weep or cringe, its simple moral that goodness matters, that individuals matter and that good individuals matter most, cuts to the core of social behaviour. Capra didn't invent the themes of his movies, though his mythology came to accommodate them. If so, Charles Dickens occasionally wrote Capra-esque stories, Jesus gave Capra-esque sermons, and the ancient Greeks invented Capra-esque myths. Nor was the Capra the only filmmaker to weave personal philosophy into his movies. So what is it about Frank Capra? What is his legacy? 
Francesco Capra was born in 1897 in Bisacquino near Palermo, Sicily, the youngest of seven children. Capra means goat in Italian. The town's name is derived from the Arabic rich in waters. In 1903, at the height of Italian emigration, the family booked passage for America. Millions of Italians from the south emigrated just one generation after the unification of Italy in 1861. The mass migration was seen as an indictment against the way that unification was carried out, as well as the increasingly desperate plight of the labouring poor in Italy. Conditions in steerage on the steamship were miserable, and experienced Capra never forgot. You're all together, you have no privacy, you have a cot, very few people have trunks or anything that takes up space, they have just what they can carry in their hands or in a bag. Nobody takes their clothes off, there's no ventilation, and it stinks like hell. They're all miserable. It's the most degrading place you could ever be. But as the ship passed through New York Harbour, Capra's father admonished his son, aged six, in what could have been a scene from one of his later movies. Ciccio, look! Look at that! That's the greatest light since the Star of Bethlehem. That's the light of freedom. Remember that! It seems Capra internalised that idealistic message during his life and advanced it in his films. Capra was never one to wax nostalgic about his Italian ethnicity. Indeed, he often insisted that he was American, without any hyphen and without deep ties to Italy. That ferocious desire to become American and erase what may have been, for Capra, an embarrassing past, came to fruition in his film work. Even with relatively positive images of Italian-Americans, as in It's a Wonderful Life, Capra absorbed ambivalent stereotypes about Italian migrants from his adopted country and conveyed them in his films. Once in Los Angeles, Capra's entire family, including his young siblings, began working, struggling to make ends meet. Capra fought to go to college against his parents' wishes, working several jobs to pay his way through the California Institute of Technology, Capra, who sold newspapers, waited tables and worked at a laundromat, as a tutor and at a power plant, became the only one of his siblings to attend college, graduating from Caltech in 1918 with a degree in chemical engineering. After graduating from college, Frank Capra was asked to join in the fight against the Axis powers in World War I. In the war, he served as a second lieutenant. He was later medically discharged from the army after getting the Spanish flu. After the war in 1920, he officially became a naturalised citizen of the United States. Even though he was not required to join the army again, since he was middle-aged at the time, he signed up anyway for World War II. During this war, he worked mostly on propaganda films for the American cause, rather than fighting. While in San Francisco, California, Capra, with 12 cents to his name, answered a newspaper advertisement placed by an actor who was looking for a director to help him create film versions of his favourite poetry. He showed up at the studio, announced that he'd just arrived from Hollywood, and fast talked his way into his first directing role. His first ever taste of filmmaking came at age 24 when he directed a 32-minute documentary on the visit of the Italian naval vessel Libya to San Francisco and the crew's reception by the San Francisco Italian Athletic Club. While selling books in Los Angeles, he read an ad about a fledgling San Francisco movie studio. He was offered $75 to direct a one-reel silent film, which was shot in two days. That led to work in Hollywood with Harry Cohn, future president of Columbia Pictures. He soon was a top-paid director at Columbia Studios filming silent movies. He became instrumental in lifting the studio out of the poverty row category. In the years between 1936 and 1946, Capra was given relatively free reign after Columbia Pictures reaped massive box office earnings from his comedic 1934 hit, It Happened One Night. That was when he made those four signature films, which feature idealistic lone individuals set against corporate and political elites. American Studies scholar Glenn Allen Phelps argues that Capra's darker version of American life, exemplified in those films, is under-recognised. I would sing the songs of the working stiff, of the short-changed Joes, the born poor. I would gamble with those pushed around because of race or birth. Above all, I will fight for their causes on the screens of the world, Capra once said. The four films share similar dramatic arcs. 
An unassuming young man from small-town America is confronted with the power of large institutions catering to a secretive, corrupt elite. Idealistic values eventually prevail. At the time, he worked mostly with short, silent films. He would do some of the filmings, but he also worked as an assistant director, film cutter, and he did several other things to process the film for production. From the earliest days of his directing career, Capra refused to work on any project on which he wouldn't have full control, modelling himself after other authors like D.W. Griffith and Charlie Chaplin. That simple notion of one man, one film, a credo for important filmmakers since D.W. Griffith, conceived independently in a tiny cutting room far from Hollywood, became for me a fixation, an article of faith. I walked away from the shows I could not control completely, from conception to delivery. The critical stock of Frank Capra has fluctuated perhaps more wildly than that of any other major director. During his peak years, the 1930s, he was adored by the press, by the industry and, of course, by audiences. In 1934, it happened one night won nearly all the Oscars, and through the rest of the decade, a film of Frank Capra was either the winner or the strong contender for that honour. Long before the formulation of the author theory, the Capra signature of a film was recognised. But after World War II, his career went into serious decline. His first post-war film, It's a Wonderful Life, was not received with the enthusiasm he thought it deserved. Many contemporary critics are repelled by what they deem indigestible and have even less tolerance for an ideology characterised as dangerously simplistic in its populism, its patriotism, its celebration of all American values. Critics noted that its depiction of small-town bankers as corrupt exploiters of regular people ran afoul of post-war American optimism. Indeed, many of Capra's most famous films can be read as excessively sentimental and politically naive. These readings, however, tend to neglect the basis for Capra's success, his skill as a director of actors, the complexity of his staging configurations, his narrative, economy and energy, and most of all, his understanding of the importance of the spoken word in sound film. Capra captured the American voice in cinematic space. His career bridged divides that plague America still. Capra was a scientist. His facility with evolving film technology helped him advance, whose Catholic faith informed his movies. He celebrated urban and rural communities and lived in both. He used the whole state, its rivers, mountains, deserts and people of many origins – he often cast parlour Indians as Asian characters – as his canvas, his test audiences and his inspiration. He relied on preview audiences in Oakland, Santa Barbara and Riverside to guide his movie editing. When Hollywood turned harsh, he would regret not becoming a scientist like his friend Edwin Hubble, the astronomer. Capra himself retired early from Hollywood failing to connect reliably at the box office. His films live on, popular with subsequent generations at ease with more sinister portrayals of American life. He retreated to Fallbrook, purchasing a ranch on Red Mountain, in that section of northern San Diego County. There, Don Francisco, as he dubbed himself, grew avocados and, like any patriotic Californian, fought with the federal government. After being sued by Camp Pendleton in 1951, in a dispute over water rights to the Santa Margarita River, Capra made an anti-government film and joined the board of Fallbrook Public Utility District to continue the water fight. In the 1970s, he gave part of the ranch to Caltech and moved to La Quinta for the rest of his life. As Capra himself admitted, he never quite lived up to his own ideals. His ego was the size of Mount Whitney. His life wasn't always wonderful. Capra maintained that the best way to promote democracy was by celebrating everyday people and everyday values. Mankind needed dramatization of the truth that man is essentially good, a living atom of divinity, that compassion for others, friend or foe, is the noblest of all virtues, he wrote. Films must be made to say these things, to counteract the violence and the meanness, to buy time to demobilize the hatreds. Frank Capra's health began to decline after he suffered from a series of strokes in 1985. His health continued to decline until he had a heart attack in 1991. His heart attack caused his death on September 3, 1991, in La Quinta, California. 
Frank Capra was 94 years old when he passed away. Of course, it is not Capra's California life, but his California-made films that make him a household name. In today's cynical and dangerous times, his sincere vision seems more relevant than ever. If you liked this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe if you are new here, and if you want to support my work, please visit my Patreon page. Now it is your turn. What do you think about the life and legacy of Frank Capra? In a moment when the leader of the free world is counting out pennies and defunding outreach programs to pay for a wall to keep people apart, we need Frank Capra's fantasies of goodwill like a cool drink of water in a desert.